Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm acutely aware that I'm the last thing uh, in between, well, almost the last thing between you and the weekend. So um, if you've had a week like I have, you're probably already imagining that first pint. Um, so I'll try and make this interesting and hopefully uh, be able to get something from it. So um, my name is Rich Cullen. I'm a solutions architect at Kazing. Uh, I've been working there the last couple of years. So it's meant I've had a lot of fun uh, playing with some cool technology and uh, helping some people build some really interesting applications built on top of WebSocket. So my plan today was to um, take you through a bunch of demos that are kind of, some of them are proof of concept, some of them are quite frivolous, but hopefully give you an idea of the kind of things you can do uh, with WebSocket technology. Um, so we'll go through some demos. A um, bit of a talk about the background of what WebSocket technology uh, is, what it allows you to do, uh, what the design goals were for WebSocket in the first place. Um, and then we'll look at actually taking this to the next level. So rather than just showing things bouncing around the screen, let's connect to some devices and show some more kind of IoT-type uh, use cases. And then the last thing, after I've painted a rosy picture of how easy all this is to do in practice, um, I thought we should talk about some of the uh, concerns that become apparent when you actually try and put these systems into production uh, and actually deploy them live. Uh, and then if there's time, uh, we can do some questions and answers at the end. So what I thought I'd do is um, start with a couple of um, simple demos just to give you a, a taster of what's, what's possible. And actually, just a quick show of hands, who's already worked with WebSocket, either from a hobbyist perspective or actually done something in production, use commercial offerings as well, maybe open source? Um, so yeah, a few, a few people. So it's, I mean, it, it's still a relatively new technology, but um, it, it's, it's, it's becoming widely adopted now. So uh, what we're seeing here is um, nothing wildly exciting. It's just a ball bouncing around on a canvas. Um, my browsers are connected to a server on the east coast of the US. It's an Amazon uh, cloud instance. Um, so not very interesting until I link these two up. Now, what's happening is you've got two separate browsers. And I was actually going to do this one of them on my mobile phone, but I'm getting patchy uh, reception for some reason. So um, these are two separate clients talking over the web. Um, and like I say, I'm obviously here. That server is on, is on the east coast of the US. Now, what's actually happening here is rather than just rendering the ball bouncing around inside the canvas, it's at the point it, it um, crosses the, uh, the boundary. You're sending a message back to a WebSocket server saying, the ball's left my core at this angle, this speed, etc. cetera. Um, it's now up to you to render it when it comes onto your side. The other side is, is listening to that, that, uh, that data. The message comes through, says, OK, thanks very much. I'll render it. Now it's bouncing back your side. There you go. So I mean, kind of frivolous little demo, but it gives you an idea of the kind of thing that's, um, that's possible. Now, something a little less bouncy. Um, so this is something a bit more representative of, I mean, it obviously looks a bit more business-like. So this is the kind of thing that we'd built as proof of concepts to talk to um, kind of tier one, tier one investment banks. So people are building uh, HTML5 desktop-based single dealer platform type um, setup. So what it's allowing me to do is um, drag and drop currency pairs that, that I'm interested in, um, in seeing. So. What's actually happening is, again, I'm connected to that, that same server in, uh, in the east coast of the US. There's a simulated data feed that's um, simulating um, you know, stock prices, uh, et cetera. Um, and what I'm doing on the client side is actually subscribing to some of that data. So I'm not subscribing to everything. I'm not just being bombarded with all the currency pairing prices. Uh, I'm only subscribing to specific ones that I, that I drag out. So there's things that allow you, you can be quite intelligent in terms of the, uh, the data you send across the wire. But something that should immediately be apparent is that the, the actual data rate uh, we're receiving data at here is, is pretty fast. We're getting, I'm now setting it to send 100, 100 messages a second. Um, that's something that if you were doing this over Ajax, for example, background polling, you, you'd struggle to get this kind of performance. So um, one last one I will just show you is a it's a quick video, and then we'll talk a bit more about um, <coughs> what's actually going on under the hood. So 
This is actually a video of the person who was originally supposed to be giving this talk if he wasn't having um, passport issues and unable to get out of the United States at the moment. But um, what he has built is a... It's a collaborative... Um, we call it a light table. So it's... As you'll see in a minute, he's, he's going to set up his desktop. It's, it's all bra well, browser-based um, and also uh, running uh, a browser inside a, a, an iPad as well. So there's a desktop application on his... Um, on his Mac, um, again, it's a, it's a canvas-based thing. There's a bunch of images representing uh, photos on a, as if you throw them on a desk. Um, he's going into Safari on the iPad and basically browsing to the same site. So at this point, the, the two sessions are paired, if you like. They're, they're talking, uh, again, via the same server in the US. So as you can see, uh, Peter's doing things on the iPad. It's immediately represented um, and rendered identically on the, on the desktop. Uh, and as you'll see in a minute, he'll go over and do the same thing uh, using the mouse. But, I mean, the latency, considering this, he, at the time he was filming this, he was, on, he was in California, this um, East Coast server. Um, so there's, you know, the underlying network latency is, is, is pretty low. Um, uh, sorry, is, there's a reasonable underlying network latency, but it's not actually that noticeable. I mean, this feels real time. Um, so what he's going to do is go over to the desktop, do the same thing, um, so when you'll get... Obviously, you get the same mirrored setup. Uh, and what he's getting ready to do now is to do the same thing, um, but actually control both the iPad and the, uh, the, the, the laptop version at the same time. And you actually get to see the bi-directional nature of, of, of what's underlying here. So you can actually... You, these are two, two applications totally talking in real time, um, which... It can, I mean, this, this was very difficult to do uh, up until fairly recently. So... We'll do now is have a look at what's actually going on under the hood. So, so before we look at how this is done, if we just take a quick look at what the web has traditionally looked like over the last 20, 25 years, it's we've always had this dichotomy between the the systems on, inside the back end, uh, inside the trusted networks. So your back end services are communicating with a, a middleware tier, uh, sometimes the web tier. That communication is done over generally a TCP network. So you've immediately got bi-directional, uh, full duplex communication. I can send data, it, I can receive data over that same connection any direction um, at, at any time. So although you still have the concept of a client and server, it's actually it's quite easy for, for a, a client to be sent data rather than just have to ask for it every time. But the web has kind of been in the way. Um, there's, uh, we've been hampered to an extent by the protocol that's been the, 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 the foundation of it. So HTTP is what uh, is that's how we communicate over the web today, um, and it's a half duplex uh, protocol effectively. So it allows you to make a request and receive some data back, which makes sense because the uh, how it was born about was to allow university professors to share, uh, share static resources, if you like. So. I ask for something, I get it back. Now, if you think about the, something like that trading application we just had a look at, um, it would be a fairly inefficient way to try and build that by constantly asking, what is the latest euro-dollar price? What is the latest euro-dollar price? Which may not even have changed, so you're making redundant requests. So because, we, because we, we're using the web at people's expectation in terms of what you can do with applications and uh, you know, what, what we want to be able to deliver for, for customers yeah. is... People's expectations haven't really um, haven't really changed. They they still expect the kind of um, behaviour that they they're used to for applications when they're sitting inside the, the corporate network. So, a few of the shortcomings of HTTP that you know what, what do we need to get over in order to actually enable us to build more reactive applications? Well, shortcoming HTTP was designed originally for static resource um, retrieval, which is what it's very good at, and there's a whole ecosystem that's built up around that. Uh, with HTTP2 on the, on the horizon, that it's going to get a bit more efficient. But as it is today, the actual protocol itself is very verbose. So uh, if you want to just send some data, if you've, it, it's, there's a lot of um, metadata, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of headers that have to be sent every time, some of which is redundant. Um, because it's stateless, you, you're having to send things like cookies so that you can uh, maintain, maintain state inside the application server. Um, but the main, possibly the main... Uh, uh, um, thing that constricts you is the fact that it's a half duplex connection. You have to ask for uh, for something before it can be sent back to you. So we've come away. We've come up with some pretty elegant ways of tr trying to simulate real time uh, using HTTP. So we've kind of twisted it into uh, to enable it to deliver some of this functionality with things like 
you know, Ajax polling, so I'll, long polling, I'll leave a request uh, hanging at the end until there's some, something to send me, and then you send it back, and then I'll make another request uh, and comment and a few other techniques. But they are all essentially elegant hacks, so, which was why WebSocket was born. So the, the, it was there to try and meet this need for a more um, real-time, uh, easier to implement across the web, uh, more socket-like connection, basically. So um, th this, it, it's a standard now, so it's, um, it, it's uh, been standardized. I mean, it's, it, it's a double standard, if you like. So the standard covers the, the protocol itself, so the actual bytes on the wire. Um, are governed by the IETF, um, and then there's an API. The, the first API to be standardized was the JavaScript one, so um, across all the browsers now, um, they will support uh, uh, the API and the protocol, and you can use WebSocket.open, et cetera, uh, it, it, new WebSocket. Um, it's, it's more like, a, I mean, it is effectively TCP for the web, and I'll go on to explain a little bit more about what I mean by that in, in a second, but it basically unlocks the, uh, the inherent TCP transport that's underneath uh, HTTP and, uh, and, and what we're all used to building on top of behind the corporate firewall. Um, the actual overhead in terms of the protocol itself, it's very efficient, so framing for the kind of, if you're sending small amounts of data, um, like perhaps just the, the currency pricing, rather than having to wrap it in you know, you know, 1K plus of HTTP headers and, and cookies, et cetera, uh, you can just frame it with a, a few bytes. Uh, so that low overhead tends to translate into uh, lower latency as well. Um, and as you'd expect, it, it's, uh, it supports uh, encrypted channels. So uh, it, it's, uh, there's, where you've got HTTP and HTTPS, you've got WS and WSS. So brings you a few advantages. Um, explain probably most of those. I mean, but mainly the, the main advantage is the fact that it's, it's full duplex. So you can send text and binary data. As soon as you've established that connection, data can flow in any direction at either time. So it's, it's less, um, it, there's less of this kind of boundary between a client and a server, which, which I think maps very well to how we're building applications today. So we're as much generators of data as we are consumers of data. So um, this is the kind of transport that we need to, to build these applications. Um, but what it was not designed to do, I mean, it was never aimed at being a full replacement for HTTP because, like I say, there's a very good um, infrastructure that's built up around that. We've got content delivery networks. We've got HTTP caching, all sorts. Um, and what we think, uh, and uh, it's becoming popular now, is use WebSocket for the, d for the delivery of dynamic data, but use HTTP for what it was designed for and, and use it for that retrieval of the static resources. So if you're building an application, you, you tend to make, if we look at, say, the, um, the, the bouncing ball demo, we've made an HTTP request, we've got the JavaScript, we've got the uh, HTML, everything we need, and then for that messaging piece to say, the ball's over in your court, we're using uh, this, this much more um, bi-directional uh, communication channel. So what it allows you to do ultimately is, if you think about this, uh, the, the kind of communication patterns you had available to you, you've got request response. I'm a client, I ask for something, you send it back. Great. Um, that works for some stuff. But if you look at the kind of things that we need to do nowadays, um, th we need a, a better way, a, a better mechanism for, for, having the, for implementing these communication patterns. And WebSocket for the web is, is probably, uh, it, well, it's, it's the best way of doing that nowadays. Um, so in the socket itself, it, we've obviously had sockets before uh, in, in the context of the web. We've had uh, flash sockets, we've had uh, Java applets, uh, sockets, etc. cetera. Um, but they've tended to be quite, difficult to maintain uh, when you deploy them because you've, you, you're obviously at the mercy of people having plugins installed, etc. You don't have this nice standards-based, I know that's going to be there, we can just um, use open APIs, standard APIs, etc. So, uh, and you don't have to punch holes in your firewall to, to make sure people have got access to security policy files, etc. So the, the, the reason it's called WebSocket is because it's web-friendly. So. Um, the, a WebSocket request will actually start its life out as, a, as an HTTP request, which we'll show, see in a second. So what do you end up with uh, in comparison to where you were before? Well, a truly event-driven end-to-end architecture. So you haven't got this kind of conversion of half-duplex protocols in this middle tier to a, a full-duplex protocol in the back end. You've actually got end-to-end. -end. As soon as you've established that connection, you as a client can just sit there and say, I'm interested in, in this, uh, this price changing. If it changes, tell me. If it doesn't, don't do anything. Let's not send any unnecessary traffic on the wire. 
Um, so this is very powerful in terms of the kind of applications you, you can now build. So um, just a very quick bit on the actual um, the, the JavaScript API itself. So I mean, it's something you can just fire up a, um, as soon as you've got a WebSocket server and there's any number of implementations out there, uh, WebSocket org actually has a, um, a, a simple echo service on it, so you can ping a message to it and, and you'll get a message back. So you can test this out just from, from the you know, a, a developer console on a browser. Um, but it's designed to be a very simple socket API, as you'd expect. You've got an, a bunch of event listeners, so uh, on open, which allows you to make sure that you're not suffering from race conditions. You open up a socket connection, uh, and, and rather than you sending messages before you've actually the, the connection has been established, you would use the on open um, callback to make sure that now that now it's now the connection is established. Now I can send messages. I, I can receive them. Um, similarly, on close. Which is, um, I mean, I'm sure as you're all aware, if you're building stuff that's uh, deployed to web and mobile, uh, the, the connectivity, it, it's not the most resilient connection. People go into, uh, drive into tunnels. Uh, there's, you know, you're not always going to have um, a connection. So that connectivity can be severed at any point, and you need to be able to deal with that in a, um, in a, in a graceful manner for your application. So um, OnClose gives you that hook. Um, and then sending and receiving data is, is, is very, very simple. I mean, it's, uh, you can send, like I say, text binary data um, and close the socket uh, when you're finished. So as I said, the, 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 it, it's web friendly in the fact that it actually utilizes the existing web infrastructure. So one of the things that was uh, looking really problematic with the initial, initial specification was actually the fact that um, that it didn't have this HTTP handshake. So this was Kazing's input into the, the, the WebSocket standard. So um, when you open up a, a WebSocket connection, what actually happens is, under the hood, it's, it's actually an HTTP um, up, upgrade request. So the client will send uh, a request to the server saying, do you speak WebSocket? And the server says, well, yes, I do, or no, I don't. Uh, yes, I do. It returns with an HTTP 101 response, um, at which point, the HTTP effectively gets out of the way and is replaced by uh, WebSocket, which kind of, like I said earlier, it, under, it unlocks that underlying uh, TCP type connectivity. So WebSocket it, itself is great, and um, it, it allows you this bi-directional c communication, but the whole point of it really was, it was designed to be TCP for the web. Um, and what do I mean by that? It's, it allows you to layer protocols on top. So. If you think about how you would build uh, a chat or an email application behind the firewall, you would actually, you're not going to be sitting there at the TCP layer, well, most of you not maybe, um, not going to be sitting there opening and closing sockets and dealing with uh, individual TCP packets. You're, you tend to be talking using protocols on top, so IMAP, POP3, POP4, uh, XMPP for, for chat applications, etc. Um, now, where does HTTP sit in that? It's, it's kind of at the same level. It, it sits on top of TCP, but it, it's not a natural fit for transporting those um, protocols on top. Whereas if you look at where uh, WebSocket fits in, um, it sits very nicely under there. And uh, there's a lot of implementations out there that actually make it very easy for you to uh, lay a lightweight pub sub, for, it, for example, over WebSocket. So you never even see the WebSocket uh, API. You're working at a higher level, which, which makes sense to you from a sort of business perspective. So, I mean, say for example, you're using uh, AMQP as a messaging protocol. You'd actually have AMQP all the way from the client through to the back end. It's just the transport for the web bit happens to be WebSocket. Behind the firewall, it happens to be TCP. But you're looking at this kind of messaging fabric on top, and you've got this consistent view, um, which ultimately gets the web out of the way so that you don't have this, um, th this challenge of, of converting uh, things across. So enterprise messaging. Is a kind of good is a good fit for this. So if anyone, uh, you guys probably all know JMS, um, but if you're already using JMS behind the firewall, how do you extend that out to web and mobile clients? Well, if you can find a way of proxying um, WebSocket traffic into something like a JMS broker or an AMQP message broker, um, you can actually have a polyglot communication because, which is one of the reasons for, for messaging in the first place. You can decouple your systems. They don't even need to be talking the same. They don't need to be written in the same uh, technologies. They can be just using a common protocol to, to talk. Um, and if you think about how this may fits into things like microservices architectures, a um, bunch of different components, completely isolated, don't need to know necessarily who's uh, sending the data they're using. They don't need to know who's using the sender they're generating, sending the... Uh, Generate using the data there, generating. Um, and that allows you to, I mean, you get all sorts of advantages like scalability, easy to maintain, it's very extensible, et cetera. So 
We think this is the kind of architectures that's starting to make sense. Uh, they've made sense behind the firewall for a long time, so why not be able to treat web and mobile clients as the same kind of first-class citizens of these types of architectures? That, you know, that, that, let's get the web out of the way, and that's, uh, what, that's one of the things that WebSocket allows you to do. So, um, Just show a bit more, a few more demos just to give you a, a little bit more of an idea of... Um, what this allows you to do, and I, again, I was going to show this one live, but um, it, my experiment earlier failed, so I think I'll just resort to a video, which is a bit less exciting, but give you an idea of um, what's going on. So we've got a um, WebGL rendered, uh, nicely looking racer car, um, but actually what we, and you can actually drive this around. If you go, go to the website, you can actually drive this, this around with your keyboard, but what you can also do is uh, open up your smartphone, as you can see in the bottom right, and actually use that as a remote control um, to, to drive the car. So it's just using Tilt. Uh, again, actually all that's happening under the hood, and this is very simple to implement, is it's just generating messages. So the car is subscribing to a data feed saying, um, if I get told to drive in a certain direction, then just tell me about it. Um, and if, if there's no data, I'm not going to ask you for it. I'm just going to say I'm interested in, in this kind of stream of data. Um, the mobile application, very simple, uh, forward, backwards, left, right, just based on tilt, um, is generating messages accordingly. So it's, um, every time you tilt it and stay tilted, it will send a message every X milliseconds and, and render the car accordingly. So I mean, hopefully you're getting the kind of idea that this is stuff that, I mean, although this looks like a fairly frivolous use case, it, it's, you can see that the actual communication channel itself underneath could, can be quite powerful. Um, so next demo I was going to show was a right. Let's actually do this one live. So what we have here is a. I mean, this is kind of like it's meant to be representative of a sort of real-time dashboard, if you like. So it's similar to the the FX Trader um, demo. What would what I've done is um, I've written a a node backend, and all it's doing is Subscribing to the Twitter streaming API, um, every time a, a tweet comes in, it's publishing it onto a message broker, and then we're using WebSocket to extend that out to web and mobile clients. And this client is just uh, using a couple of charting libraries. Um, it's subscribing to this Twitter feed, if you like, but it, it's a kind of processed Twitter feed that I'm republishing. And then just doing some really simple um, <laughs> streaming analytics um, by just deciding which uh, which country that tweet was was based from, and then just uh, showing a, uh, a graph accordingly. So again, it, this is it, most of the, the uh, data is actually being sent downstream to, towards the client. Um, but what I'm also doing is using a control channel to uh, control a, a sort of level of conflation in, in the back end service. So I'm up increasing and, and decreasing the speed of the um, the feed. Um, but what this looks a bit more interesting is when you open a um, second session and you can see at the moment there's only uh, the, the messages getting sent. At, I'm, I'm limit, uh, limiting the messages at five a second, but um, I can use another client to control the rate, and you can see that the, the rate on, on both, uh, it's completely, uh, completely synchronized. Now, in this case, um, everything's running locally on my Mac, but um, because of the low latency of WebSocket, you, you're, you're much more, you're not limited by this need to poll, so you, you, you've got much more control over your latency, it's much more predictable. So for certain applications, that's really critical for performance. Um, so just one more I wanted to show. Just kill the other one. So yeah, the last one is for this bit is yeah something I'll call a, a smiley face demo. So it's a it's, it's just a drawing board. Um, so it allows you to uh, draw stuff. Uh, okay, that's interesting. And then we look at say, open up another. Um, if I close this one a little bit. Um, I'll open up a second one. So let's clear the screen here. Um, now, similar to, to the light table, I, I'm just drawing stuff in real time, and you can see it's um, it, it's being 
reflect, uh, reflected in, in, and rendered in the other window. Exactly the same thing going on. Every time I draw something, the mouse event is captured. Uh, send it to, to the WebSocket server, republish it back out to any other clients that are interested. Now, that itself isn't particularly interesting. We've already seen an example of that. But if you combine that with um, a back-end uh, database system, and maybe, maybe you say you start recording this activity, uh, and then it gives you the ability to play it back, then what you can do is something a bit more interesting. Um, so if I start recording here, and let's just draw um, a smiley face, because it's Friday, and we're all happy and excited. Um, so there we go. Uh, right, I stopped recording that. Now I'll clear the screen. And as long as I did remember to start all the components running, if I play that back, so we're now we're seeing what I drew in real time. So I'll, I'll show how the, how this was built in a second in terms of the architecture. But it's, I mean, again, obviously a very frivolous example. But if you think about use cases for this, um, you could use it for auditing purposes. It could be. Um, Certainly, you know, constantly streaming data from the client into a back end. You've got the ability to replay things. It could be a trading application. You may be interested in uh, the state of a market and how something happened and how your systems were affected. Uh, it might be a compliance uh, thing, for example. Um, what you also get is, and again, I mean, it's just the same thing, but if I um, replay this at a different speed, um, that's what I did, but just a lot faster and wasted less of your time. So. Right, if I um, go back to the presentation. So if we have a look at what, what was sitting behind that, um, behind that demo, it's actually a very, very simple architecture, really. I mean, the, the, the browser is just talking via a WebSocket server to a, um, a message broker. Um, there's a process sitting in Node on the other side of the message broker that's subscribing to any data coming in from, uh, from these clients. Uh, and any time a message comes in, it's kind of time stamping it. Uh, and dumping it in the database. And then when I said, give me a replay, it's basically just sent a, again, using WebSocket, sent a control message through. Uh, the node client said, OK, he, he wants a playback. Um, I'll retrieve the data from the, the database, and I'll replay it in this, you know, the same kind of time, same time gap so he, you get an accurate representation uh, depending on the speed that you've uh, requested. So what is, while this is all interesting, um, maybe the, what is more interesting is actually connecting devices. So everyone talks about IoT nowadays. Um, so the, the challenge there is to bridge, well, firstly, bridge the gap between hardware and software. So that's the first challenge. But how do you do that? So luckily, we've got a whole number of options. So I don't know who's um, people have played around with Arduinos or um, uh, Raspberry Pis or Intel Edisons and things like that. But effectively, you've got the ability now to, to run software on a chip. Um, you've got a bunch of I.O. ports that you can uh, either use to, to allow your software to react to what's happening on the hardware, uh, or you can actually influence what's happening on the hardware by setting uh, uh, you know, highs and lows on, on these pins. So Raspberry Pi has been used for a couple of the demos I'm going to show. Uh, we also use uh, Arduino as well. But uh, for people who don't know, Raspberry Pi is a, a very small credit card size computer, uh, runs Linux as an operating system. Uh, and effectively, you can treat it as a, a sort of open source prototyping tool almost. So you can prototype something, and then when you went to production with it, you could shrink the shrink, shrink it down to something uh, actually production worthy. So, okay, well we looked at this. We've got WebSocket connectivity. We've got Raspberry Pis. Uh, we had a light bulb moment. What what can we do? Um, and the, perhaps the simplest thing you can do is um, I'm sure there's a joke in here somewhere about developers and a light bulb, but. Um, we, we can use a, we can we can show physical objects interacting um, actually over the web. So to begin with, we just uh, made sure we'd hooked everything up. We hooked the switch up to the Raspberry Pi, made sure that we could detect the uh, the, the, the change in state of the switch. Um, we also made sure we could actually get the light bulb on and off. And through a single Raspberry Pi, that's great. You can flick the switch and you've got a light bulb on. Okay, not very exciting. Um, but if you, considering the Raspberry Pi can run Linux, and you can, uh, there's a JVM, obviously, you can run. So you could run a Java client, for example, speaking over WebSocket to the other instance. So what you end up with is uh, an architecture looking like this. So you've got uh, maybe the light bulb at the top, the physical switch here. Um, but as soon as you've moved into the realm of software, it's not, we're not just talking about physical switches. Then actually, it's just messaging uh, across the web. Um, so why not instead get rid of the switch? We can actually use a, a, a mobile phone to uh, to uh, 
influence the, the behavior of the light bulb. So uh, a, a trans global light switch, very exciting. Um, but if we think about what well, we can do something a bit more exciting, right? So if we look back to the, the demo we showed, uh, the demo I showed about the, uh, the Formula One car. So if we apply that same, um, th that same think thinking to, to a physical uh, item, so let's go to Toys R Us, let's get a monster truck, let's rip out um, some of the controls and uh, let's hook up the servos to a Raspberry Pi. So a bit of work involved um, on the sort of, uh, electronics front, but ultimately we, we, this is the same thing effectively as combination of the light bulb, um, the, uh, so there's a Raspberry Pi strapped to the back of the car, you can probably just see. Um, and effectively, the, the way the car's being controlled is, is identical to the, uh, the Formula One car you saw driving around on the screen. So we've taken something out of the screen, we've put it on the floor, uh, and we can now drive it around using, uh, effectively, the, the web to enable a, a remote control. So this is, if you think about IoT use cases that people talk about, you, you quite often hear about sensors generating data so that it, it's, it's inbound uh, data that's being processed by a back end. Um, so here, this is just the same thing in tandem. So they're both, they're both subscribing to the same data so you see a kind of synchronized swimming type effect. But the important um, takeaway from that is that maybe IoT isn't just about receiving data from, uh, from sensors. It's maybe it isn't just about that. Perhaps you, you've got the ability to, uh, because everything's bi-directional, why not send data in the other way, uh, the other direction as well? So, so what's the next logical extension of, of this? So, um, so just to show you, I mean, as you'll see, that the architecture for all of these is actually very simple. You've got to, and very similar. It, it's it's messaging over the web is effectively what's enabled us to do all of these. So, what's the next logical step? Well, if you look at telemetry, I mean, there's obviously been some high-profile uh, air incident and, and black box um, things reported in the news over the last couple of years. And one of the things that I guess maybe doesn't make sense is that why do you need to retrieve a black box to actually find out what was going on? Um, what if you could send that data in terms of what a plane is doing in real time back to, uh, back to a, a, a center for, for monitoring? Um, so that gave us an idea for a proof of concept. And we couldn't afford a 747, so we forked out for a, a quadcopter. Um, and decided that, okay, well, maybe we, let, let's see if we can get this to work. So we bought a um, DJI Phantom 2. Uh, one of my colleagues in the US, we, we basically built a sensor stack that we thought was light enough for the quadcopter to, to handle. Um, so there's a, inside this, there's a, an Arduino, there's a, a GoPro camera, um, things like a humidity sensor, thermometer, compass, etc. And originally we were thinking, okay, well, we can actually get end-to-end -end connectivity just using the, uh, the, the, our, our software and a, and a WebSocket server. But it turns out to get a uh, satellite connection, because we were doing this in the middle of nowhere for health and safety reasons, um, requires a satellite terminal. And these things tend to be quite heavy. I mean, it's about the size of a, an iPad and uh, maybe it's one or two kilos or something. Um, and as Peter realized, having run around with it for a while, you, you're not supposed to actually pick the thing up and, and be exposed to it for too much time. But the, so what we had to do as a compromise was we, um, we, we actually used Zigbee, so kind of long-range Wi-Fi, to get the data off the, um, the, the kit that was, that was strapped to the quadcopter because it, it was not strong enough to, to handle the, um, the, the satellite. Um, we had a, just a Mac running, um, which was connected via Inmarsat, so it was getting an IP address uh, via the satellite, um, but receiving data from the, uh, from the quadcopter. So, um, and then the quadcopter, as I said, was, was, uh, uh, had a few of these devices attached. So um, I'll show a short video because I didn't want to fly it around inside the room and um, give you an idea of what, what this looked like. So what we built was a effectively a kind of real-time dashboard of what's um, what's going on. Um, this is a little bit about the. So 
as the quadcopter is flying around, it's basically sending out kind of what I was ex ex uh, explaining earlier. It's just sensors sending data. So as, as it's flying around, it's, it's giving us its GPS location. It's giving us its kind of pitch and yaw. It's giving its uh, altitude, um, speed, etc. Um, there's humidity, uh, all these kind of things. The video was overlaid afterwards, so we, were, um, we weren't actually streaming the video. We, this was being recorded by the GoPro, and we just overlaid it on the video. But as you can see, as it's moving around, you're actually getting a kind of a real-time representation of what that quadcopter is doing, uh, all enabled by, uh, by WebSocket. Now, we weren't using WebSocket to, uh, to control the device, but, uh, and I'm not saying that would have necessarily been a, a fantastic idea, depending on connectivity, etc. But it, it does give you the option of you have now a, a really powerful bi-directional communication channel. Um, and even though this is, this is data being sent in, uh, inbound, effectively, from, from uh, a sensor, um, I mean, yes, people say, well, couldn't you just do that with HTTP? Well, yes, potentially you could. But if you think about the scalability in terms of how many of these things, uh, or you know, whatever these sensors are, there tends to be lots of them. And, uh, there are lots of scalability concerns, which I'll come on to in the end, in terms of um, things like bandwidth utilization, et cetera, when you start really receiving data at, at scale. Um, so let's say goodbye to the team. And I'll just give you a, another quick overview of how that was built. And then um, we'll go on to the last demo. So. In terms of the end-to-end -end latency, yes, under one second. So the the biggest delay was actually the um, although that that's that's kind of the architecture we would have liked to build. As you saw, we did it slightly differently. But the the hop from the uh, base station up to the satellite and back took about 650 milliseconds. But once you're back on the ground, um, your, your the web socket connectivity, the latency is very very low. So in theory, you could have uh, you know a plane flying, um, someone sitting in a monitoring center anywhere on the globe, and they would receive that. If the plane turns left, you would know about that within less than a second, which could be valuable, right? Um, so the last demo I wanted to show was, um, I guess it's just another logical extension of that. It's, um, we, we've now had unmanned vehicles being uh, monitored and data uh, flowing over WebSocket, but how about um, let's actually plug this into um, to Kevin's car. So um, let's attach it to a real-life vehicle. And it, this really is a sort of true IoT use case. So um, it's pr pretty similar in terms of, of, of what's being rendered. But what's actually happening here is that we'd plugged into the, uh, the engine control unit in a car. So there's, um, I don't, don't know if people know, but there's uh, kind of standard for uh, getting diagnostics off vehicles. There's this onboard diagnostics. And we, we plugged into uh, an OBD port there. Um, we were tracking uh, GPS location. Uh, again, there's another GoPro uh, camera just to give it, make it look a bit more exciting. But you can see that this data, like the, uh, uh, the number of revolutions per minute, the, um, uh, the, the actual accelerometer, um, engine temperature, etc., cetera, um, is all being delivered truly in real time. I mean, again, this is actually now all inbound. But if you imagine this kind of um, use case, if you were, say, a fleet monitoring company or something, you're interested in the, the health of your vehicles, not just the location, but actually, you know, are my cars actually running, oh well, running OK? Um, it might allow you to be a bit more proactive to, um, uh, to kind of make it maintenance, et cetera. Um, and again, maybe this isn't very exciting when you're just seeing just a single car, uh, but if you can imagine that being an entire fleet and seeing location and vehicles turning red when uh, th it looks like there might be a problem, then you can actually alert the driver. There's a lot of exciting stuff uh, you, can do, you can do with this. So, I mean, hopefully that gives you a few ideas of the kind of things that you could do that would have just been very difficult to do with traditional um, uh, web technologies. Um, now, I said... Earlier, you know, oh, actually, I'll just go just for anyone who's interested. This was just the, the stack that we used for that. So, um, uh, I mean, you, you can see what was in there. There's a, a WebSocket gateway. I mean, the, the, the web UI was um, obviously Google Maps in the top half, was SVG for the bottom half. Um, but the, the sort of geeky connectivity bits was, uh, yeah, Bluetooth uh, and some, uh, some uh, little components for plugging into the carport. But, I mean, what I'm trying to say is, it's really just, it's not just the web anymore. I mean, uh, it, the web is, it's, everything's connected. Uh, Internet of Things is, 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 on, is upon us. Um, and 
if you look at, I mean, one of the big challenges that needed to be solved really is we've got all these great ideas for wearables, et cetera, but how are they actually going to connect and what, what, what's going to be, what's the traffic that's going to be um, going over those connections? So you've, got, you've now got connected devices, the ability to connect devices. You've got, we can now use WebSocket to connect these devices through to back-end services and we can have stuff going in either direction at any time. Um, but more importantly, we can have any kind of protocols you like flowing over WebSocket between, uh, between these devices and the back-end services. That might be uh, MQTT, might be AMQP, et cetera. Um, messaging over the web, you know, truly IoT um, uh, enabling. So I'd mentioned a bit earlier that you know, maybe it's not quite as simple as this, and when you actually look to put things into production, that there are things that will hurt you, and I mean, that's one of the reasons that companies like Kazin can exist, etc. cetera. Um, there, there's a lot of challenges that you need to meet. So uh, I'd said, we, it, trying to provide resilience in a what is actually an inherently unreliable network. I mean, as soon as you're using a mobile phone, you're going to struggle to to have a, a consistent connection. When you're dealing with persistent connections, which is what WebSocket is, um, it, you know, the ability to know that that connection has been severed and actually deal with it in a graceful manner is really handy. And if you compare that to, uh, say, traditional HTTP, where you're firing a request off and maybe you don't know whether you don't get a response, what's happening? What, is, the, is the server still thinking? Did, I, did it disappear? Is it going to respond at all? Um, with WebSocket, you can actually be a bit smarter with things. You can, uh, for long-running long requests, you could maybe detect that in the back end and say, look, we are still processing. We haven't gone away. Uh, just to let you know, we'll send you a message back and, and let you know it's going to be a little bit longer, etc. It just does open up a lot of um, different uh, opportunities for you. Um, but things like to actually be production ready with these things, you, you do need to think about, you know, as you guys all know, you need to think about disaster recovery, you need to think about high availability, etc. Um, battery life is a key concern for people now. I mean, anyone who creates a mobile application that chews through your battery is not going to last, uh, you'll, you'll be uh, deleted in five minutes uninstalled. So. I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it needs to be thought about. But I mean, what I would say is that um, don't be scared. I mean, there are there's, there's products out there that can help you. Um, there, there's people out there that can help you. I mean, you know, give it a go and see what WebSocket capabilities can bring to your applications. And don't be scared. Just do it. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if there's any questions. If anyone's asked any, let me just check the. Uh, We have, oh, how well does WebSocket scale? Um, good question. Um, one of the things, well, it, there's a few things you need to think about. So firstly, it's a, um, it is a persistent connection. So if you think about in the context of a, just say a, a website and you've got, um, let's say peak load, you've got 100,000 people on your website at one time. Um, with HTTP, You've probably got a load balancer sitting in front of this, so distributing traffic a bunch of, uh, amongst a bunch of different nodes um, in an application server farm. Um, but if you think about how many people are actually connected to a website, even though they're on it and they're looking at stuff, how many people are actually making a request um, at one time? I mean, maybe it's something like, I don't know, 10%, for example. So you might have 100,000 people on your website, but actually maybe there's only 10,000 connections going through a, a load balancer, being uh, directed to whatever the request is being dealt with, and then there's a, a response coming back. And then effectively the load balancer can say, well, I've done my job for that connection. I can free up the thread and someone else can use it. Um, with WebSocket, because these are persistent connections, you, you do need to think about um, the scalability of your load balancer, for, for example, because you've now got what might look like a, a bottleneck through um, through the load balancer. Now, there's a few ways that um, that, that can be solved. With uh, you know, you can actually uh, use redirection instead of load balancers, for example. That is one way of dealing with that. But in terms of how it scales, in terms of um, resources required on uh, the back end servers, it it really depends what you do I mean, and what your use case is. I mean, for something like the, um, say that, that trading application I showed earlier on where you've got um, uh, basically a lot of people maybe interested in data that's common. So if you were building that behind the firewall, I mean, maybe you would actually just let everyone connect to, say, the message broker individually. But actually, if it's common data that they're interested in, then why not try and offload uh, the, the load on that back-end broker, why not say, well, look, if 100,000 people are all interested in the uh, euro-dollar price pairing, there's no point us all connecting to that, um, to that load balancer. Um, we might as well 
uh, just connect once and the, the message uh, broker can just publish the message once and maybe your, uh, your web server can actually do the, the fan out of that data to common people. So I think in answer to the question, um, it, it really depends on your use case. I think what we and how it scales comparatively to HTTP depends on what you're trying to do. I think what's becoming very clear is that if you're really trying to build very responsive applications, the only easy ways of doing that with HTTP is to just constantly poll the back end and that is, you know, that, that is not an efficient, um, efficient way of doing things. I think ultimately there really shouldn't be a need to, to poll back end services. It should be, um, you should be able to just, uh, um, just say I'm interested in some data and it, when that data occurs just you know, send it to me. Um, so second question, uh, yeah, does regular browser security strengths comply so cause? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, so, it, because it's, again, it's, it starts its life as an HTTP request, so um, allowing the, hi, um, allowing the, um, the, the browser to, uh, so allowing that backend server to send the, um, I forget the name of the, uh, the, the header now, but it, it's, yeah, cause is, is fully um, compliant. Whether all WebSocket solutions are, co are cause compliant is another matter, but it, the, the, the um, uh, yes, it, it, the answer is you should be thinking about this. So yes, uh, it is possible. Um, so what is the state of browser support? How will, yeah, how old will IE? Well, how old? How does old IE handle anything very well anymore? Is, is a question. Um, IE six uh, does not. I mean, thankfully, I think IE six is actually dead. Um, I was there twice. Um, IE seven, eight, and nine did not support WebSocket. IE ten was the first version to support it. Um, which it comes on to another of the um, concerns. If you're thinking about actually building these applications and deploying them in real time, you do need to think about um, what percentage of my clients are actually going to be able to get a WebSocket connection. So that's good to get upvoted. Um, the, uh, I've lost my train of thought now. Hi, Mum. <laughs> The, yes, so it, it, it is widely supported. So all the modern browsers do support it. But yes, uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of corporations out there that still um, still suck on XP, even though it's not uh, actually officially supported anymore. But the um, if you're on XP, then I think the the highest IE version of IE you're restricted to is actually IE eight. So. There's, there are products out there, uh, and, and we've got one of them that, that will provide some sort of fallback mechanism. I mean, we call ours emulation, but it's a fallback mechanism to, I'll try a WebSocket connection, and if I can't get one, I'll, I'll use an alternative mechanism. And, and at, quite often, that just happens to be long polling. Uh, one of the things that our solution does, which I think is, is superior to competition, is actually um, truly emulate a WebSocket. And at the point we... Uh, at the point our uh, gateway product was originally built, there were, there were, even though WebSocket had been standardised, there wasn't any support by the browsers because it was still um, it, it was very very new uh, technology. So to begin with, what we were dealing with, but that was actually 100% um, emulation. Um, and if you can, if you've got a full understanding of the bytes on the wire, and you've got a very intelligent process for kind of um, mapping upstream and downstream channels, because you're having to use HTTP at this point. So in order to get bi-directional communication, you need something upstream and something down. But if you can get an intelligent um, uh, way of doing that, then you know, that, that, that will allow you to not worry about the fact that maybe your clients won't have WebSocket support. You can, you can be confident that they're still going to get some connectivity. Uh, and the better the emulation strategy, the closer that's going um, to be to, to you know, the kind of performance you get with WebSocket. Um, yeah, good question to uh, yeah, connection drops. Um, something like the car, uh, like you say, I mean, it, it's, some of these examples were um, examples of just data inbound. I think the, one of the things that we, we talk about in terms of why WebSocket can actually be an advantage is this just general scalability in terms of things like bandwidth utilization. So I think the, the, the network, uh, you know, the telecoms companies are getting very concerned about the fact that there's people's uh, bandwidth utilization is growing exponentially, but the, the network is not necessarily keeping up. So anything you can do to keep individual representations of, of, of meaningful data down to an absolute uh, minimum. Um, so to use an analogy, if I'm sending you a business card, rather than putting it in a cardboard box and sending it to you, I, I put it in an envelope. That is going to have a huge um, reduction in overall traffic, which can save you money depending on, um, you know, if you're a mobile user, maybe your data plan's getting chewed through much more slowly. Uh, if you're a company paying for, you know, large amounts of data traffic, you can actually reduce it. So I think in terms of being resilient to connection drops, um, 
you've obviously got to be careful for things like uh, TCP half open states. So I don't know if you've ever dealt with that kind of painful stuff, but if you um, WebSocket uh, part of this, the the standard the, the protocol specification for on the wire actually supports um, ping pong, so WebSocket ping pong packets, so really tiny control frames that you can uh, implement and just say, look, um, if you're implementing if you're uh, implementing the, the the spec interface, then if someone sends you a ping, you have to send them a pong back. So you can you can take advantage of that and build on top of it for kind of easy heart beating of, of systems. So you know, what does it mean to you if a connection drops, right? Do you as the back-end server need to know that that client's gone away? If you do, uh, one way of doing that is to uh, implement these kind of ping-pong packets and you, the, as people come in, your server will say, are you still there, are you still there? And because this is very efficient, it's not kind of polling, it's, it's, it, we're talking about two or three bytes on a wire, then you can detect uh, whether a connection has dropped and if that means something to your business, you can do something about it uh, in a very short amount of time. So I think we're out of time, and uh, I think we, can do one more. we can do one more. So the uh, hi mom is very popular. So yes, can data be compressed? So yeah, WebSocket will. Um, you can transport anything over it, so it will support binary data. So um, if you're using WebSocket, the raw API, and you send a text message, it will be sent as a text message. You could actually, if you use something like Wireshark, you'll see the the, um, the, the WebSocket framing, and you'll see the the, the raw, the, the clear text. Um, you can send binary. Um, you can therefore send anything. You know, if, if you want to compress data, send it over WebSocket, decompress it, etc. Then yes, absolutely. I mean, we do get asked a lot about whether or not it makes sense to send. Um, kind of streaming video or, or audio over WebSocket. And I think with WebRTC and you know the existing mechanisms for streaming data, then it's not necessarily the, the best fit. But however, there's nothing to stop you chunking data and just you know, recording video, chunking it up and sending it over WebSocket, if, if that makes sense to you. But in terms of um, uh, what you send over WebSocket is completely up to you. It's, it's, uh, it will support binary payloads. So, um, so that's it, I think. Um, so in terms of if anyone's interested in any more information, there's a few uh, links you might find useful, but um, ultimately, uh, thanks for coming, thanks for your time, and uh, enjoy your beer. <laughs>